Greetings and thank you for coming back as always. Bit of a global update now. Um, look at the World Health Organization briefly and then we'll look at the US and the UK. Some predictions about the United States and then we'll just look at a few other countries. We'll see how we'll see how time goes. But there was the uh, Friday briefing from the World Health Organization, their weekly briefing. So I thought we'd have a quick look at this. I haven't covered this for quite a few weeks now because, uh, well, I just haven't covered it for a few weeks now. But um, this, is, so this is Dr. Ted Ross who's speaking in his opening address. He talks about uh, the Northern Europe, uh, Northern Hemisphere, all of the Northern Hemisphere actually, as being at a critical juncture. And of course he's right and... Uh, to be quite honest, you don't need to be the director of the World Health Organization to realize this. We'll be giving a lot of evidence for this in this report, but it's good to see that he uh, concurs about the critical juncture that the Northern Hemisphere is currently in or at. Uh, tough times ahead for countries in the Northern Hemisphere. Next few months are going to be very tough. And some countries on, are on a dangerous track, he says, without mentioning the particular countries. An exponential increase in cases in many nations, we know this, leading to hospital increases, which we are starting to see. And we will be looking at the United Kingdom data on this, hopefully, and we'll see that this is actually quite accurate. The US data is less convincing, to be quite honest, but we'll, we'll come on to the specifics. Um... Now, five things that governments need to do, according to Dr. Ted Ross. Assess your, your current situation in your country, identify cases, clusters, conduct an honest analysis. So here, Dr. Ted Ross is pointing out the need for good live uh, intelligence data. We need to know what's going on as far as possible. So it's a fairly obvious statement, but it is a correct statement for sure. Make necessary adjustments to healthcare facilities. Um, that's a bit ominous, but um, I do agree with him. Be clear and honest with people. Now, we've looked time and time again <clears throat> in this video series at countries which have been transparent with their populace. And time and time again, we've seen that this transparency and this honesty typically feeds through into better understanding and therefore better compliance with necessary measures. So I do agree with this completely. We don't need to keep people in the dark. We need to be honest about the situation and that'll get the best out of them. I agree with that as well. Um, put systems in place to make it easier to comply, assist individuals and groups with the necessary measures that are required. Again, um, impossible to disagree. This is, this is apple hood and mother pie type statements. But he's the head of the World Health Organization, so it's worth going over them. Share good practice, speak to people with specific instructions. And again, he emphasizes isolate all cases, all cases, and quarantine all their contacts. It's never too late to act. So, yeah, nothing to disagree with there. Then he went on and talked about the uh, various World Health Organization successes in promoting oxygen use around the world, which of course is... Is completely essential and life-saving. He did say that oxygen is the most important medicine, and um, that 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 is that, that makes sense to me. Um, now, countries that were issued out for singled out for particular difficulties last time: South Sudan, Somalia, Chad had great difficulties with oxygen infrastructure. In fact, basically, they didn't have any. So, the oxygen that was available in these countries was entirely commercial, and that meant that poorer people missed out. And this is, this is quite tragic, that people would die because they can't afford a few dollars to have oxygen for a, a day or two. Now, to be fair, South Sudan, Somalia and Chad, thankfully, appear to have low cases and low complication rates, as we've looked at many times before. And one thing I really like, I, I'm, I'm really into this, I don't know about you, but the solar-powered stuff. Solar power to run oxygen concentrators in remote areas. Great idea. Let's roll it out. Nothing to disagree with there. <clears throat> Maria von uh, Kirchhove, who's the technical lead for the COVID pandemic. European cities, the capacity for ICU is going to be reached in the coming weeks. Well, that's, that's concerning. 
But let's now go and look at the uh, the specifics um, of this data. Now we'll start off here with the United States. I think if I can get it on that screen, yeah. Um, this is right, yeah. So total cases in the United States, cases in the last seven days, and uh, total deaths, unfortunately, in the United States, of course, continue to rise. As indeed, total deaths can only continue to rise. Now, the CDC, and I put the link for this in the notes, really worth looking at, fascinating data, very well presented, very intelligible, very clearly done. Um, so here, this is the cases, the last seven days, and this is the overall count. And uh, the darker the colour, of course, the worse the situation. And as you would expect, the situation is worse in the, uh, in the more populated states. So we've got California, Texas, Florida. So it's interesting to look at the rate per 100,000, and hopefully we can do that. Yeah, there, there you go, amazing. And we see this great increase in the northern states, unfortunately. Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, significant increases. And even a uh, significant increase there in Alaska, look, in terms of per capita. But what continues to confuse me a bit about the United States is when we go into the hospitalizations. So here we have the weekly hospitalizations and we see that these did go up. Now that week there is the week ending the 10th of October, but the latest data, the week ending the 17th of October, hospitalizations actually seem to be going down. Now, um, <clears throat> I've watched quite a few newsreels from the United States, and, and they, they, they highlight hospitals with great problems in terms of capacity and staffing and ability to look after these patients. But uh, I think from this data, we have to assume that they're localised problems. And of course, people in the news report where there's problems rather than where things are going well. So overall, despite the increase in cases in the United States, the hospitalizations don't seem to be keeping pace with it, which is a sign for encouragement. There will be some slight counter argument coming shortly to that. But uh, let, let, let's carry on with the specific data rather than talking in a vacuum. So Mr. Biden uh, talks of a dark winter due to the second wave. And um, he doesn't say that that would be dependent on a particular outcome in the election. He, he seems to be talking about this as something which is uh, inevitable. So Mr. Biden are fearing a, a, a dark winter, a difficult winter for the United States. Um, 39 states increase in cases over the past two weeks. Check out these links and go, go to all the, all the amazing graphics you get these days. But as we saw, hospitalizations don't seem to be going up as much. Now, good news, AstraZeneca, that's the Oxford vaccine, and Johnson & Johnson, both of their vaccine trials were suspended for quite some time in the United States. The AstraZeneca one, there was a person in England developed inflammation of the spinal cord. The Johnson & Johnson one, we don't know what illness the person suffered from that caused the trial to be stopped. But it does appear in both of these cases they've concluded that the illness suffered by the patient was not caused by the vaccine. And of course, when we have very large numbers, we would expect some people to develop illnesses. So it's not surprising. So both of those are back on again now, heading towards the 30,000 recruitment level that both trials would, would want. So they're returning to phase three trials. So that is, that is encouraging that that's back on. And uh, two men both have pledged free vaccines for all when these are available. So two men have pledged free vaccines for all, for everyone in the United States. And of course, those men are Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So thankfully, we're able to maintain complete political neutrality on this channel because both men have uh, pledged publicly. Uh, to uh, to make free vaccinations available to everyone who wants to take it up in the United States. And that's encouraging. Now, we have looked at the Institute for Health Metrics based in Washington State University before on this channel. And 
they do seem to be a very thorough think tank, I must say. So I'm going to look at some of the things that they've put out. And they did a report just this Friday. So this is bang up to date information for the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, University of Washington, 22nd of October report. Now, they say the fall stroke winter surge has begun in cases and deaths. Now, the deaths are only up slightly in the United States. They've been fairly flattish for a long period of time, but they do detect an upward trend. It's not a big upward trend, but they do detect this. And as we've just noticed, the hospitalizations don't seem to be reflecting that at the moment from the official hospitalization data. But nevertheless, this is a very uh, well thought out report. Um, re read it, read it for yourself. It's all it's all there. It's, it's accessible. It's not a scientific paper. It's written in intelligible layman's language. You'll have no difficulty understanding it. Which, of course, I like to see. In, in, in the Engl England, we have something called, in the UK, we've got something called the Society for Plain English. You know, just say things so that it's intelligible. Um, because very often, people in professions... Who, who said, what, who, who was it that said a profession is a conspiracy against the rest of us? You know, they talk in ways that we sometimes don't understand, but this report is completely intelligible. Um, so this surge has begun in the United States, according to this data. I'm not pretending this is good news. It's not. It's terrible. Several weeks behind the massive surge in Europe, which we've looked at many times and is definitely occurring in Europe now. And we will be looking at the UK as an example of that shortly. So what the Institute here is saying is that, yeah, autumn, fall, winter surges started in Europe. The United States was a bit behind, but hey, it's going in the same direction. And that is consistent with the data as I understand it. And they clearly have analysed the data with numerous experts. And that's what they've come up with. Now, they predict. Now, this is a prediction. We don't know. No, no one knows. You know, if you knew who was going to win the 330 next Saturday at Chepstow, you'd be a millionaire, you know. But no one knows the future. But this is based on their predictions. Um, surge will intensify in November and December, reaching a peak in January. So very consistent with what Mr. Biden says of a dark winter. Uh, that's going to lead to many states having enormous pressure on hospital capacity. Reimposition of some social distancing mandates is anticipated. Basically, this means lockdown measures, which, of course, no one wants. It has tremendous social and economic impacts. But they do say the main factor that can mitigate that is expanded mask use. They are great advocates of expanded mass, mask use, as am I, as I do trust that if you're watching this channel, you will be too, I am sure. Current situation, cases and deaths up. Now, the deaths aren't up a lot, thankfully. Well, yes, yes, we're talking about deaths here. It's easy to talk about numbers, isn't it? But 680 last week. This is the week ending the 22nd of October, 710 uh, daily deaths. So a slight increase. But as we've said, deaths have been fairly flat for some time. So I am still encouraged that the, uh, the case fatality rate is certainly lower than we had uh, feared. Um, and I'm hopeful that the infection fatality rate is lower than we've feared as well. But they do say that the uh, effective R number is over one in many northern states, as we've just seen, unfortunately, on that, uh, on that graph we've just looked at. When we looked at the um, per capita increase in northern states, um, quite really... Uh, well, that, that, that map is, is just very striking, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's almost an emotion-inducing map. You can just see it before your very eyes then. Um, so uh, the, the R value over 1, which of course means there's going to be exponential growth. Um, also increasing in Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, Mississippi and Alabama is the trend at the moment. Now, trends in key drivers of transmission, we always have to look at why the cases are increasing. What are the driving the transmission? And of course, they point out the obvious factors. Mobility of people with social mixing. Mask use or lack of mask use. 
testing that Abel's targeted isolation and shutdowns and quarantining and seasonality as people close the doors, put on the heating, reduce the humidity, make less vitamin D, all those things that are associated with seasonality and respiratory infections which always go up in the winter time. Now um, the trends in the social compliance have been largely unchanged over the last few weeks. Mobility remains constant at the national level. So mobility, people moving around, people come into contact. The national level has stayed the same. Only California and Hawaii have, have uh, levels that are less than 35% of the pre-COVID baseline. So in terms of people moving around, going around, visiting people, California and Hawaii are less than 35% of the COVID baseline. So for most states, it's not going well. And of course, as it rightly says, this is a driver of transmission. Now in the states generally, um, approximately two thirds are wearing masks outside the home. That means one third are not. That's 33%. That's way too many people not wearing masks outside the home. And the uh, name and shame, um, lowest mask use rates are in Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota. Don't know why that should be, but uh, if you live in one of those states and you're watching this video, I know this doesn't apply to you. So thankfully you're doing the right thing and it's just a matter of carrying on doing that and encouraging others to do so. Now projections, what's going to happen? Now, um, yeah, the, 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 we've looked at the, uh, the, the current deaths here on, on, on this 223,393 plus 946 in the last 24 hours on this current data. Uh, their projections are daily deaths to reach well over double, 2,200 a day by mid-January. So we've now increased to the 900s there. They anticipate that's going to go up to 2,200. And the cumulative total, currently at 223,000, they think is going to go up to not far short of 400,000, unfortunately. Um, the precise figure, cumulative deaths by the 1st of February, their models predict 386,000 individuals. Um, now, this is making some assumptions. Um, the assumption behind that death figure is that uh, it assumes reimposition of social distancing mandates when the death rates reach eight per million. If these are not reimposed, if there's not more restrictions, then that figure could be uh, even higher, which of course would rather not think about. It's vital to expand mask use to 95%. This is with the level seen in Singapore. Well done, Singapore. Uh, and we know that the uh, pandemic was greatly, greatly caught out in Singapore. Expanding masks used to 95%. So at the moment, they're saying it's about 66%. There's about a third not wearing masks. If that could be increased to 95%, uh, greatly delay the imposition of mandates cost with great social and economic costs and save 630,000 lives. So um, no doubt about the efficacy of mask wearing in Washington State University. Now, moving on to the UK, I'm going to start off with deaths from the UK at the moment, because uh, I can't quite work out if this is good news or not, um, tentatively. Anyway, I'll give you the fake figures rather than speculating. Deaths in England and Wales. Uh, full data, 9th of October, week 41. Deaths registered was 1.5%. Um, above the five-year average. So this is the overall deaths, 1.5% above the national average. Is that significant? Well, the answer actually no, is that's just random noise. That's just random fluctuation. Uh, the numbers would have to get to 1,200 deaths above the norm to be classified as excess above random variations. So basically, the deaths for the time of year, we can say, are currently normal. 
Deaths from coronavirus, flu and pneumonia combined, currently running at 16,021. And there'd usually be 16... Uh, so, sorry, 1,600, 1,621. 1,621. Um, and there would usually be around 1,600 from flu and pneumonia. So again, this is pretty well upper limit, upper, upper edge, but it's pretty well normal for what we would expect this time of year. Um, so the respiratory deaths were essentially at a normal level. Um, essentially, no community flu just now, though. So, but the point is, I think the point is, I read this and I thought, well, this is good. Um, deaths are kind of where we would expect even without COVID. But then the flu season hasn't kicked in yet. And at the moment, as we speak, there is essentially no community flu in the United Kingdom. But the flu season hasn't started yet. Vaccination programme is going well, um, but the cases haven't started yet. And we would expect them to start round about November. We normally start getting admissions in um, with flu and complications of influenza. So a bit early to tell, really. And of course, remember, this data is only going up to the 9th of October. So it could well be it's just this delay effect. Um, deaths, certificates, 4.4% mentioned COVID-19 in the week up in week 41. Uh, COVID deaths up by 117 in the past week. So that is starting to be a bit of a trend um, since last week. So last week it was 3.2%. This current week, it's 4.4%. But of course, the current week is the last week for which full data is available, which ended on the 9th of October. Um, so we do have this lag effect. Uh, UK as a whole, um, total deaths, 11,359, which was 197 deaths higher than the five-year average, but 85 fewer than week 40. So again, um, deaths not seeing massively concerning trends as of the 9th of October but um, we have this dreadful phrase baked in and when we look at the hospital situation uh, in the UK let's flick on to that now um, admissions are clearly going up and these are COVID patients um, total patients admitted so but patients in hospitals that's cumulative um, yeah, that's cumulative total. So um, currently in hospital reported on the 22nd of October, uh, 7,850 7, at the moment. Of those patients being ventilated, 743. And we know sadly that patients on ventilators um, don't have a brilliant prognosis. So um, looking at the graphics, patients admitted to hospital, so no question, it's a continuous increase. That's the last data point there, which uh, oh, that's back to the 17th of October, that data point. But th th this data on the top is is current. Um, yeah, last updated 24th of October. The graphics are a bit behind, but we can certainly see the upward trend. Total number of patients in hospital. Act there. Oh, well, again, definitely see the upward trend there. Again, last data point there is 20th of October, 19th, uh, 19th, yeah. But on a definitely, definitely an upward trend and uh, patients in uh, intensive care, upward trend. So um, I think basically what we're saying is that the, the Office for National Statistics data has got, has got this lag in it. And, and there will be more deaths, unfortunately. In fact, inevitably. Um, now, cases up to the from the 10th to the 16th of October, um, slightly more up to date. Infections continue to increase in England and Wales. Community infections in England, 433,000. That's one in 130 people in England. Uh, increased infection rates in all age group, highest in older teenagers and young adults, were the main uh, increasing areas. Or demographic. Uh, moving on to the areas. <laughs> uh, North West Yorkshire. The North West, that's sort of Liverpool, Manchester area. Yorkshire and Humber and the North East were the 
areas with most cases in. Now Wales, which of course is now essentially locked down, cases are new community cases there, 16,700, much smaller population, works out at one in 80. So England is one in, one in, uh, England's one in 130 people. Wales has actually got less, it's uh, one in 180, but it's locked down. Northern Ireland, it's higher, it's one in 100, and Scotland, it's one in 180 people with infections, with, with active infection in that week of the 10th to the 16th of October. Uh, cases now, we've just got a graph on just to illustrate the point really. Um, of course, these cases here were massively underdiagnosed. The actual figures there were times 50. So we're not quite up to where we were, but that direction of travel is, is unmistakable and is uh, typical, unfortunately, of many places in Europe. Now, I think we've gone on for nearly long enough today, but I'll just give you a quick whiz through a few countries. Um, now, Wales, Gloucestershire borders Wales and the police are patrolling the roads. Uh, if anyone drives out of Wales, they are liable to be stopped by the police. And if they do not have a good enough reason to go into England, uh, they'll be turned back. Simple as that. I uh, don't know quite what those reasons are. Um, in Australia, like we've reported many times, Western Australia, for example, had no community transmission for six months <clears throat> because the borders are closed. Anyone coming into Western Australia for any reason has to 14 day quarantine. So it's nothing like as hard border <clears throat> as they have in Australia, but yet um, that's what's happening. Um, Greece, Athens is now mandating uh, people wearing masks outside, good, outside the house. Curfew, not a long curfew, but there's a curfew and a couple areas in, uh, in lockdown at the moment. So good that uh, masks are now mandated in all outside public places in Athens. Germany uh, was doing quite well for a while, but now cases are increasing more steeply. And uh, Chancellor Merkel <coughs> asking people to stay at home, reduce socialising as much as possible. Netherlands, now this is concerning, already sending COVID-19 patients to Germany. Now it's not a lot, it's probably a couple of few helicopter transfers, but um, not a good sign that that's happening <coughs> already and it's only October. Spain, Prime Minister of um, Spain saying it's going to be some very hard months and is appealing for greater discipline in uh, containing the virus to avoid another drastic lockdown. Spain and Italy had very high levels of compliance in this first wave, but do seem to be struggling with public compliance now. So I must say I was surprised how good the public compliance was back in the first wave. Perhaps it was anxiety driven, but it's disappointing that it's not better than it is now. These simple, simple measures that we talk about on this poster we see every day. Um, right. Italy cases have increased by seven since the start of October. Now, to be fair, they were very low at the start of October. And we actually uh, looked at reasons why Italy did so well. Basically, Italy wasn't as complacent as other countries were in summertime and uh, enjoyed the benefit of that throughout uh, August and September. Um, but since the beginning of October to now, cases have multiplied by a factor of seven. So Italy, unfortunately, catching up with other countries like Italy Italy catching up with other countries like Spain, France and the United Kingdom, unfortunately. And there's been protests, been protests lots of places really. UK, the, London there's been protests, Czech Republic there's been protests, Italy there's been protests. Um, Czech Republic uh, now over 1500 cases. I do hope you got the chance to watch those two excellently informative videos we did with Pavel yesterday on the Czech Republic, small country. Central Europe, a very, very interesting case study. Um, lots to learn from it. Very good compliance in the first wave. Not so good compliance in what we're now calling the second wave in the autumn stroke fall surge. 
And Czech Republic is the fastest growing in Europe in terms of per capita. In cases are increasing more quickly and there are lockdown measures uh, in place um, or restriction measures in place anyway. Although people are not complying with these in a, in a, in a well-spirited way. So, um, yeah, I'm not pretending it's good news really. Um, we've given evidence for being concerned over the next few months and um, I think what I'll do is, rather than say anything else, I'll just let you dwell on the evidence because really it speaks it speaks for itself. Anyway, thank you for watching this video as always. Uh, I get very lonely by this time if you don't stay with me. So for those that have stayed for the whole video, thank you. And uh, yeah, stay, stay safe and well. What, what, what else can you say? It's going to be a difficult few months.